we are live. Okay, shall I start? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Hi everyone, and uh, thanks for joining the seminar. And uh, uh, just a reminder that we have been recorded and live stream on YouTube until around uh, 12 45. So if you do not want to be recorded, uh, I suggest you to exist here and watch the talk on YouTube. And feel, uh, feel free to join us again after the talk. And uh, um, now I will spot a little bit in case someone wants to move on to the YouTube. Okay, <clears throat> hello again. And uh, before we start today's seminar, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce the Trustworthy Machine Learning, um, Trustworthy Machine Learning Initiative. We start out as a group of people informally discussing this broad area research of explainability, explainability fairness, robustness, and uh, at the central, including all the desirable traits that we want for our machine learning models to have. And it will almost be a year for us running this seminar soon. Our initiative has multiple goals. Firstly, we want to make it easy for everyone to access the fundamental resources. Our website has a curated list of such resources ranging from introductory to advanced. We also want to provide a platform for early career researchers to showcase their work. Actually, for the next week of this seminar, we will have some interesting student talks lined up. And to encourage discussion and debate, we have an active Twitter handle. If you haven't already, please follow us today. And lastly, we will be organizing symposiums and workshops in the near future to strengthen our community. Now back to today's agenda. Today's session is divided into two parts. The first hour is the talk and the moderate chat with the speaker. The second is the free flow participant discussion. The speaker will give the talk till around 40 minutes later. And if you have questions in this duration, please submit them in the Zoom QA2 and they will uh, be answered periodically. If time permits, more technical questions will be answered at the end of the talk. And this will be followed by a fan chat with the speaker on the speaker's journey. And at 1 p.m., we will take a five-minute break and, and restart at around 1.05 Eastern time. And feel free to bring your comments, opinions, and questions to have a fan chat with us. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> And now without further ado, today we are honored to have Dr. Sherry Rose. Sherry is an associate professor and uh, co-director of the Health Policy Data Science Lab at Stanford University. Her methodological research focuses on machine learning for prediction and causal inference. And within health policy, uh, she works on risk adjustment ethical algorithms in healthcare, comparative effectiveness research, and health problem evaluation. And <clears throat> remarkably, Dr. Rose is co-authored co the very first book on machine learning for causal inference back in 2011. And she is the recipient of numerous awards. Also, she comes from a low-income background and is committed to increasing justice, equity, Justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the mathematical and health sciences. Okay. So, Dr. Rose, if uh... great, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here today to. Uh, talk with you about fair machine learning for continuous outcomes and risk adjustment. And so if any of these terms are new for you, I will talk about um, all of them in, in the presentation. I did try to 
uh, eschew most of the technical details. There are a few slides that do have some formulas for those of you that want to see the formalism to see how we actually express these things. But a lot of these are about concepts because I know, for example, a lot of people may not be familiar with some of these considerations in the healthcare space in planned payment risk adjustment. And also to give a scope of some of the literature in this area, if, for example, you haven't uh, seen what's available for continuous outcomes specifically or other areas uh, that I will talk about today. And so my background is also a little bit different than, uh, than uh, a lot of people who are working in machine learning in healthcare. So I'm a statistician by training. I have a PhD in biostatistics from UC Berkeley. And the way that I come at these questions in machine learning for healthcare is through the lens of health economics and health outcomes. Uh, to inform uh, health policy. And so a lot of times we're not necessarily thinking about health economics when we're thinking about machine learning and healthcare. And so I like to, to stress that element and how important it is when we're trying to uh, discover and understand things about health outcomes and how we can influence health policy to have more uh, equitable healthcare for all. So a few quotes that I like to start my talks with uh, to really set the tone is that uh, the first one from uh, Barbara Englehart at Princeton, learning two fields takes surprisingly twice as long as learning one, but it's worth the investment because you get to solve real problems for the first time. It is very difficult to work, especially in algorithmic fairness and not deeply understand the applied area where you may want to uh, use your new tool or, and especially if you're using existing tools to solve a real problem, you need to really invest in solving those problems. You need to really invest in learning how the data are generated, what the incentives are in the system, the communities that will be impacted. It's really a challenge when people try to parachute into an area, ask, you know, what are the X's, what are the Y's? And then that's not necessarily going to lead to a solution that is going to improve fairness for the individuals who are going to be impacted. This is especially important when we're thinking about healthcare and a lot of other applications when we think about algorithmic fairness because the impact of these algorithms is on individual people's lives. The second quote is from Rediet Abebe from uh, Harvard and UC Berkeley. In both private enterprise and the public sector, research must be reflective of the society that we're serving. There's many things that we can think about with Rediet's quote. And I really wanna stress the fact that we need to have more diverse teams. So who's on the team, who has the power to make decisions, what research questions are even being asked is all influenced by who's in the room. And so we really need to think about uh, the way that we are, um, who we're giving power, who's being hired, who's being allowed to make change. And then lastly, uh, from Nick Jewell, behind every data point, there's a human story, there's a family and there's suffering. And this is an especially poignant quote given that I work in the healthcare and population health space, because again, these aren't just data points, these are people. And so when, when, when uh, researchers in machine learning and statistics and computer science want to work with data, we need to have such a tremendous respect for this data because these are people. And this is not uh, an exercise for a career advancing endeavor. These data sets are not toy data sets there for people to use in a paper and to not care about the individuals who are in those data sets. When we're using this real data uh, and integrating into health systems, we need to have just a tremendous, tremendous amount of respect for those individuals. And so today I'm gonna to talk a lot about fairness. Fairness is an incredibly broad topic. This is a group of people who, uh, may be very familiar with fairness. I know many of you are. Some of you may be new to fairness and are interested in learning about it. Um, so there's many different types of questions we could ask. Uh, who decides the research question? This is something I brought up with, with Rediet's quote. Uh, who's in the target population? This is something that, that is a, a, a large topic in statistics in particular and other areas in population health. When we think about things like randomized controlled trials, which are often lauded as the, one of the best ways to uh, understand the impact of a treatment or a policy, we often don't center who is and who isn't being studied. And we know, for example, that there are a lot of cancer clinical trials that don't have uh, sufficient representation of individuals from marginalized racial and ethnic groups, even when they're disproportionately impacted by the cancer under study. And so, 
who's in the target population is something we should always be thinking about. Do you have a, is your sample of individuals reflective of the group that you would want to generalize to? And what fairness considerations are factored into that? What do the data reflect? I work with healthcare data, but these comments will be relevant for many other data sources. Our, our data often um, and typically reflect issues of structural racism, also issues of healthcare access in rural and low, uh, low SES communities. And then lastly, how will the algorithm be assessed? A lot of the fairness literature looks at how do we evaluate this tool for fairness and many metrics that I'll talk about today are driven by this notion of group fairness, which I'll explain more in a few slides for those of you who are not yet familiar with that. Um, but one key thing is that we really need to be centering principles of justice such that benefits, risks, costs, and resources are equitably distributed. And one of the last intro slides I have before diving into what even is planned payment risk adjustment, because I'm sure a lot of you are not familiar, I wanted to highlight one of the ways that we can integrate uh, principles of justice into our analyses as machine learning researchers is through an ethical pipeline where we think about problem selection. You know, again, who's even funded to work on research? How are the problems that we choose to analyze uh, decided? Um, data collection, are we, are we actually intentionally collecting certain types of samples? Are we using convenient samples? Is your sample um, you know, 96% white individuals and, and how is that going to impact your study and the, the uh, fairness that you're able to achieve? Outcome definition is one that's often overlooked a lot, especially in healthcare. A lot of uh, variables that may be used for an outcome or even a covariate have a lot of different issues baked into them. Uh, for example, uh, healthcare codes that are used in the healthcare system for either billing or for other reasons have pervasive missingness. And a lot of times in many different types of healthcare analyses, these billing codes or other types of healthcare codes are used as a ground truth, even though we know that there's many systematic reasons why an individual with a health condition might be missing a code and individuals who don't have the condition will have a code for it. And we need to think about the intersection of the way that these uh, different variables are coded and the you know, different social disparities in the system. Algorithm development, we'll talk a lot about today as far as how we can build ethics into our algorithm development. And then lastly, post-deployment considerations. After we launch uh, an algorithm is going to be deployed in practice, uh, how and when are we going to evaluate it for um, uh, different things like covariate shift and the other ways that we may have issues of, of algorithmic fairness developing over time after it was first built. And I want to highlight that the lead author of this uh, paper that we worked on was Irene Chen. Who, she gave a, a talk in the Trust ML sem seminar last year, and I believe she presented some of this work. So I wanted to make sure to, to put her uh, up on the screen and also uh, leave the citation here if you're interested in learning more about an ethical pipeline for machine learning. So now to dive into planned payment risk adjustment. For those of you who have not been exposed to it, and I didn't learn about planned payment risk adjustment until I joined the faculty at Harvard where I uh, met a collaborator who has uh, become a tremendous co-author of mine and uh, is partly responsible for all the projects that I've developed in this space because he was telling me about many of the issues in, in the planned payment risk adjustment system. And I saw a lot of opportunity to bring my expertise in machine learning to this space and to contribute in my way to some potential solutions. So what the planned payment risk adjustment system is in the United States and in many other countries, planned payment risk adjustment is a global phenomenon. Not every country has a planned payment risk adjustment system, but it is not something that is just US specific. The goal is to redistribute funds based on health and encourage competition based on efficiency and quality, not insurers trying to avoid high cost enrollees. And so this has massive financial implications. If we think about the average individual in the United States, uh, might cost around $6,000 a year with over 50 million people in the United States currently enrolled in an insurance program that uses risk adjustment, this is hundreds of billions of dollars in the healthcare system. And so what this risk adjustment system is, is a prediction problem. We have an outcome, we have a spending outcome, and we have an input vector of covariates. And most of these are binary flags for health conditions. And some risk adjustment systems also have 
uh, age and documented sex been categories that are also binary flags. Uh, and then we have a coefficient vector or a weight vector that we're trying to estimate. So this is a regression problem uh, that uh, probably looks familiar to many of you, but the massive size of the healthcare sector makes risk adjustment arguably one of the most consequential applications of regression for social policy. So when I started learning about risk adjustment, one of the first things that I learned about was this issue of upcoding. And what this means is that the more um, input vector variables that are flagged, so the more health conditions someone is coded for, uh, for health conditions that are included in this formula, the insurer is going to get a larger payment. So their incentive is to have individuals coded for as many conditions as possible. And this leads to something that's called upcoding. Uh, there are legal and illegal forms of these so-called charge captures. And when I started thinking about these problems and how to deal with this, these incentives of upcoding, it was um, very daunting. And I thought this, this seems really challenging. How do we make this, how do we start to think about changing, uh, continue to change some of these incentives in the systems? And then I thought, aha, I'm a statistician. I know some, some machine learning. Maybe we could bring some of these concepts to upcoding. And so one of the first things that I did in risk adjustment was look at what would happen if we were to uh, incorporate variable selection to the challenge of upcoding. And, one of, and so in one of these first studies, I looked at using ensemble mach machine learning with built-in variable selection and found that just a reduced set of 10 variables was 92% as efficient um, for predicting uh, spending, which was a really surprising finding. I'd worked in a lot of other applications, especially in areas of epidemiology, where you usually don't see this kind of uh, retention of efficiency. And so one of the things that I noted in this first paper was that replication studies in other populations, including Medicare, are ongoing. So Medicare is a healthcare system in the United States for older adults over the age of 65 and individuals under the age of 65 who have disability insurance or end-stage renal disease. And what we found is the results did not generalize. And not only did the results not generalize, but the process didn't generalize. Even using Medicare data, where we, we redid the same process, we built a new machine learning algorithm using the Medicare data, uh, I have a quote here, results for the risk adjustment algorithms that considered a limited subset of variables performed consistently worse across all benchmarks. So these were um, group fit benchmarks that we'll talk about, overall fit benchmarks, all of them terrible. And I wanted to highlight this not only to give uh, a little bit of insight into one of the first problems that I tried to address in risk adjustment, but because we often think the process will generalize. Oh, if we have more data, we can just run the algorithm again and build a new tool and then it will, it will work similarly. Um, and that's just not the case in a lot of settings. And the other thing I wanted to highlight when we're talking about who's in the target population, in the healthcare space and in population health, often um, older adults are excluded for a lot of, st of studies. And so this is an example where it was really important to understand whether this process would work in this completely different population. The original population I studied was individuals with um, uh, insurance through their employers, and it did not generalize. And so uh, individuals who are older adults is, is, is a marginalized group in the healthcare system for a lot of reasons. And this is another example of how researchers, as researchers, we need to be very aware of the conclusions we draw on who we say is in the target population and how we think our tools might work. So all of this is particularly salient for risk adjustment and mental health and substance use disorders. Um, how we manage the financing of mental health care has major implications for health with one in five individuals having a mental health condition um, in the United States and mental health costs are substantial. We know that uh, improving mental health care um, in you know, the 50 years between 1950 and 2000 was really due to changes in financing and organization of, the men of mental health care, not new treatment technologies that really made the difference. And as I said, these mental health costs are substantial. We know that mental health and substance use disorders are number one in total costs and number two for spending growth. 
And so in the risk adjustment system that we use in the health insurance marketplaces created by the Affordable Care Act, so these are for individuals who don't have large group insurance, who don't have insurance through their employer, and then also some small firms also have insurance available through the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, marketplaces. Uh, we found in one of our other studies that risk adjustment in the marketplaces recognizes only 20% of enrollees with mental health, health and substance use disorders. This is due to a lot of reasons, but it includes which codes are used and included in the risk adjustment formula. This means that individuals with mental health and substance use disorders can be systematically discriminated against because insurers are incentivized due to the high cost of individuals with mental health and substance use disorders and this undercompensation. Um, and so ways that insurers can discriminate against uh, individuals with mental health and substance use disorders is that they can change the design of their healthcare plans. This is called benefit design. They can put the drugs that they would be likely, the prescription drugs that they'd be likely to use in a higher cost tier. They can change the size of their networks to remove providers that they likely want to see. And so there's many different ways that insurers have the ability to reduce easy access for individuals with stigmatized uh, conditions uh, in, 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 that their ability to get insurance and find plans that will cover their healthcare needs. So pivoting now with that background, I mentioned that I talk a little bit about the literature landscape uh, briefly. When we think about fairness methodology, we could bucket these tools into the three buckets I have here. So pre-processing where we think about different data transformations to intervene on the data. So this um, uh, includes some of my prior work where we looked at reducing disparities in uh, low-income neighborhoods. And, um, but there's a, there's a lot of uh, space in data transformations to make really important discoveries. A lot of the work, including my own, is, has been fairly ad hoc. And so developing systematic and generalizable tools for data transformations is, is an area with a lot of open space for work. If you're interested in kind of pursuing and figuring out where there are big gaps and where you might be able to make a strong contribution. The vast majority of the work has been done in the fitting phase where people consider things like adding or removing variables, which I'll touch on at the end about how that can be uh, very insufficient and is, is typically insufficient in the type of work that I do. Um, having separate formulas for marginalized groups, which is something we've also pursued. And then a lot of different statistical and machine learning methods to build fairness considerations directly into the algorithms. Uh, and then lastly, there's uh, post-processing, which much of the work in post-processing, like much of the work in the fitting phase, has been done for binary outcomes. And so in post-processing, you might think about having different thresholds for um, different uh, marginalized groups that you're considering. And for continuous outcomes, something that we can, can consider post-processing, specifically in planned payment risk adjustment, is something called reinsurance, where we pay for a portion of high cost enrollees after we fit the algorithm. So it's a way of, of adjusting such that insurers will receive uh, more money and reduce their incentive to discriminate against those ind individuals. So now to formalize, the typical algorithmic fairness problem in computer science has an outcome Y and a vector X that includes a protected class or sensitive attribute A. The goal is very often to create an estimator that's a function of X equals Y, uh, while ensuring that the function is fair for A. And many common measures of fairness, as I noted at the top, are based on the notion of group fairness, so striving for similarity in predicted outcomes or errors for groups. And so here, if we think about all the individuals in our sample as being part it, it, within this, this maroon rectangle, and we have a marginalized group G, we can calculate metrics among only those individuals in this yellow rectangle, and then calculate the same metric for individuals who are not in the yellow rectangle, everyone who's outside the yellow rectangle, but within the maroon rectangle. And so just to add a little bit more notation, because we'll need this um, on the next slides, uh, we also have uh, sample sizes for each of these groups because we'll want to calculate those metrics within each of those buckets. And so 
Moving on to global and group fit metrics, many of you are likely familiar with R squared as an overall metric of fit for continuous outcomes. It is a very commonly used measure in risk adjustment to assess the performance of the algorithm. And here I have some additional notation that we're using hat notation for predicted spending and bar notation for mean spending. And we're indexing the overall sample with K. And all of the metrics that I'll talk about in this talk, overall fit metrics, group fit metrics are all going to be cross-validated. I tend to use tenfold cross-validation, but just to have that in there, if I say R squared, I definitely mean a cross-validated R squared because we want to make sure that we're not getting a um, misleading assessment of R squared. And we know that if we don't cross-validate, we might, uh, uh, due to overfitting, get some overestimates of how well our algorithms are actually performing. So one of the group fit metrics that, that we can consider from the health economics literature is something called net compensation. And we like net compensation in a payment setting because it's on the same scale as the outcome. So here you can see that we're taking the difference between predicted spending and observed spending and averaging over everyone who's in the marginalized group. And so we talked about individuals with mental health and substance use disorder being marginalized in the healthcare system. If we take everyone who has a mental health and substance use disorder and take their predicted spending, subtract their observed spending, um, and you know, take the average, we're going to see that they're undercompensated because we're going to see in this formula a negative value. And it's on the same scale as the outcome. So we're going to actually be able to say, oh, wow, this is 25%, 16% of total spending. Um, in, uh, and one of the things that's really important for us to understand is that information that we can glean from group fit measures uh, is, is uh, very different from what we can understand from something like an R squared and overall fit metric. So the overall fit metric is not gonna tell us what we need to understand how group fit uh, performance is doing. And so here I have an example of this. If we think about a baseline formula in planned payment risk adjustment, here we have an R squared of about 13%, which is uh, common for certain forms of risk adjustment. And we see that the net compensation for mental health and substance use disorders is undercompensated by nearly $3,000. And so what we can see if we add and remove variables, and again, this is an example from a paper we're actually talking about why not to do this, um, about how um, building algorithms and looking at R squared or looking at p-values is problematic. It's a demonstration to say, don't do this. And I want to stress that because um, there's, a, uh, there's a long, long literature about how doing this kind of stepwise regression building does not lead to valid inference, for example, and it also has a lot of other problems. Uh, but this is what is commonly done in risk adjustment. And so this is a, a, a tutorial example about how we can see R squared and net compensation change when we do this and how we don't recommend this as a procedure. So if we were to add mental health to the formula, we would see R squared increase and net compensation also increase as far as improve. Um, but we can also see examples where we have no change. Uh, if we add or subtract variables, we have no change in R squared and improvements um, or decreases in net compensation. And we can also see examples where R squared decreases, but net compensation improves. So really uh, overall fit metrics and group fit metrics are telling us very different things. Another group fit metric we could consider for continuous outcomes is from the computer science and statistics literature, the mean residual difference. And you'll see within this mean residual difference, uh, you'll still see this, the, uh, the marginalized group is uh, within, uh, is the first term in the mean residual difference. Uh, but we also have um, the complement group here. So we're subtracting off the average of the complement group. So we're looking at similar errors between groups. But one of the reasons why we don't prefer this um, in risk adjustment is it doesn't tell us what is happening in the marginalized group. With a mean residual difference of negative 500, that could mean that the marginalized group is undercompensated by $400 or it could be $0. And so the mean residual difference is a less useful metric for this specific application. Um, but I wanna stress that which metrics are going to be appropriate are very, very context specific. 
Uh, and this is another reason why you need to fully integrate into the applied area in order to understand what's going to be most relevant. And then predictive ratios are also something we could consider from the health economics literature. They're very commonly used in risk adjustment um, for looking at different, uh, different levels of spending. Um, and this looks at the relative size versus the absolute magnitude. So this is not going to be on the same scale as the outcome. All right, so um, my abstract uh, talked about three different uh, recent papers that I'd worked on and uh, with some wonderful collaborators. And the goal here uh, we were looking at is, can we improve fairness for undercompensated groups in planned payment risk adjustment? And some of the challenges that I've touched on, current formulas created with, uh, are created with parametric regression, but without built-in fairness criteria. Right now, risk adjustment is, is just estimated with standard parametric tools like ordinary least squares. And much of the fairness literature considers binary decision-making. And so there's fewer tools available for continuous outcomes. And so what we looked at in these series of papers, the first paper that I'll talk about uh, is developing fair regression methods for a single attribute with continuous outcomes. Um, and then in the second paper, we brought together fair regression for several single attributes. So the first paper, we look at only individuals with mental health and substance use disorders, but we know that there are many marginalized groups in the healthcare system. And so this second paper uh, expands that work for several of these single attribute groups. And we also incorporate post-processing as well and variable selection as well, which I touched on at the top. And then the last paper is about actually identifying groups. Who is marginalized in the healthcare system? Some groups we know, a lot of these are all just defined by single attributes, but we know that there's a lot of complex intersectional groups who are defined by multiple attributes who are marginalized. And the idea is to um, identify which groups may need further protection either in the risk adjustment formula that builds in fairness considerations or with uh, specific legal remedies, which I'll talk about at the end. And I wanna specifically highlight very clearly, as you can see, there's a name that appears in all these papers. Uh, it's Anna Zink. She's a PhD student at Harvard and she's just been a tremendous leader on all of these papers. She's currently preparing for her job market. So for anyone who's looking to hire an incredibly talented PhD student, um, Anna is fantastic. And so diving in, I, I noted that there would just be a, a couple of brief slides um, with some more complex notation. The goal of, of these uh, first paper was to create constrained and penalized regressions, again, that build fairness cons uh, considerations into the optimization problem directly. And so one of the tools that we developed was a, um, a covariance regression method that we extended to the case of, of continuous residuals. There was previous work by Zafar et al. for binary outcomes. And the goal is to solve the objective function with respect to certain restrictions. And so these covariance techniques require covariance between the residual and the protected class be close to zero. And so what we're doing here in our approach is constraining the covariance to be that less than some percentage of the covariance that we get from just a standard ordinary least squares regression. That's the high level overview. There's many more details in the paper if you're interested about in the technical components. And that paper is open access and all of the code is freely available as well uh, on our GitHub page and it's linked in the paper. The other method that was new that we contributed in the, that biometrics paper uh, was to introduce bias directly into the loss function um, you know, added uh, with a user specified penalty. And so we pr propose a new custom penalty term that punishes large net compensation because we are specifically worried about this. And so here our minimization problem is, is given by this formula where you can recognize the net compensation term. Um, and given that I mentioned constrained regression on the previous slide, I wanted to highlight the fact that we know that we can alternatively present a, um, a penalized regression as a constraint. So this is the constrained regression formulation as well. What we found in this paper were large gains in group fairness versus standard practice, which is ordinary least squares. And so you'll see at the bottom, the ordinary least squares, we have an R square there of you know, 12.9%. Again, these values are pretty standard for risk adjustment. 
And as you look up uh, the column, you'll see that the smallest R squared at the top is 12.4%, which is a, a pretty small decrease. It's about 4%, uh, it's 4%, but only half a percentage point. Our two new methods here are highlighted in maroon and the other three um, methods besides OLS are other existing uh, methods for continuous outcomes that we applied in this paper. And so what we found is that with very small drops in overall fit, we can have massive improvements in net compensation and other fairness metrics that are not included on this slide. So we saw a 98% improvement in uh, um, uh, net compensation from the ordinary least squares to the tied top two performers, the um, uh, average constrained regression and the covariance re regression. And this negative uh, 1872, uh, represented 16% of mean spending. So it was a large portion of undercompensation for individuals with mental health and substance use disorders. I will highlight, so this was the data that we studied in the paper. We also have a pretty detailed simulation study. And what we found in the simulation study, I like to use simulation studies as an opportunity to not only study your estimators under other conditions, but specifically to try to break your estimators. And what we found was that the top two performers, again, one of them was our method, the covariance constraint method. Um, we found that the average constraint and the covariance constraint method uh, did not perform well under really strong um, model misspecification. So we were able to break those pretty easily. And no method performed the best um, in every scenario as is pretty typical, but the net compensation regression um, had the best balance of features. So even though it wasn't the top performer in our, in our data analysis, the simulation studies really showed that it was potentially the most flexible and um, would definitely be an, uh, an estimator that might perform better than the covariance regression over many different studies. And there we saw, even in the data analysis, that it performed quite well. And we saw about an 86% uh, uh, reduction in um, net compensation. And so I'm a big fan of ensembles. So you can uh, you know, select many tools to use a priori to, to protect against choosing a, a poor algorithm. But it was very helpful to know that the net compensation regression was going to perform well in a lot of scenarios. So in the second paper, I mentioned that we looked at multiple groups and we wanted to extend what we had studied into now four chronic conditions that were undercompensated. This included cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and mental health and substance use disorders. And we brought in the, the, the post-processing that I talked about, as well as, as well as variable selection to combat upcoding from the start of my talk. And so the variable selection component was very exciting because we did um, a 62% reduction in variables. So we didn't get quite down to 10 like that first paper. Um, but we reduced the number of health flags from 94 to 49. So that reduces a lot of incentives for upcoding those health conditions. And then the other thing that we found was that, and this is what this, this uh, graph is showing, is that even undercompensated conditions that were not included in a loss function, because we only included four, uh, all of these other, um, or sorry, uh, 15 out of 17 of these other health conditions uh, had improvements in their fairness metrics as well. Because one of the things that we're very concerned about is how do you choose which marginalized groups to consider in the loss function? And here we saw that 88% of other, of, of other known undercompensated groups that we studied also had improvements of fairness. It wasn't taking funds away from them uh, predominantly in order to improve fairness for these four groups. What we found is that it was um, uh, moving money away from individuals who had no conditions and those individuals were overcompensated by over $2,000. And in our new formula, they were only overcompensated by about $800. So the, the formula was moving in the right direction. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about complex groups. As I mentioned, um, there are a lot of subjective decisions to make about which groups to consider in the loss function. Um, this can advantage uh, 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 marginalized groups that have very powerful and well-funded advocacy arms. And there's no standardized method for identifying uh, or prioritizing undercompensated groups uh, in a data adaptive way that, that we have found. 
And so specifically in health uh, policy for plan payment risk adjustment, we were worried that there were uh, consultants trying to identify further undercompensated and overcompensated groups uh, in the health insurance pool. This is something that we had worked on previously uh, in a paper in 2017, specifically with the drug formulary. Uh, but here we were worried about um, identifying uh, marginalized groups uh, based on uh, a number of health conditions. And in order to do this, we extended the concept of variable importance in Rain of Forest to construct a new measure of what we um, uh, term uh, group importance and identify groups defined by multiple attributes. And so we used an ensemble of trees that were predictive of the residual. And um, we studied this in, in multiple different settings. So including those health insurance marketplaces that I talked about, we studied this in Medicare, we used multiple years of data because we wanted to make sure that our procedure was potentially generalizable, or if it wasn't, that we would be able to state that. And um, we decided to uh, define groups based on factors that would be necessary for discrimination. So they must be actionable for insurers and large enough to impact revenue. Um, so we know some groups are undercompensated and that they're able to change coverage based on those groups. And so, for example, um, um, oh, one of my cats is trying to join the talk. Um, uh, for example, a hypothetical group could be um, uh, individuals with a documented sex as female who are age 55 to 59 who have heart conditions. And then we'd be able to look to see, are they persistently undercompensated over time? Are they undercompensated um, in multiple different types of insurance products? And so in our study, we decided to focus on prevalent chronic conditions that require specialist care or drug treatments because these would be targets that insurers would have. Um, size of the group, the size of the undercompensation, and the persistence over time were all factors. So we studied those four conditions that I talked about in the previous paper, cancer, mental health, heart disease, and diabetes originally. And then we expanded to many, many more conditions to about 12 conditions after we got feedback on this paper uh, that we agreed with that we should expand the number that we're considering. And so what we found um, is that a number of uh, previously unidentified groups with multiple chronic conditions are undercompensated. So the first uh, 10 rows here are the individuals who are undercompensated um, to a massive degree. So up to you know, over $25,000 in undercompensation. Um, eight out of 10 of these undercompensated groups have um, all three of heart disease, cancer, and mental health and substance use disorders. And the residuals are much, much higher uh, for these uh, uh, groups defined by multiple chronic condition than for each condition individually. So if we were just to add up these um, uh, average uh, undercompensation of these groups, uh, these, these numbers are, are much larger. And we know that, for example, a lot of these groups, when we study them as a single attribute, are undercompensated around $2,000 or $4,000. Um, we also have in this plot um, uh, overcompensation, and um, but there's a lot less. Uh, it's a smaller amount of of overcompensation, and the incentives, the incentives are still there though because these groups are often uh, much larger. Um, so, one of the things that I want to close with is that this last paper that I talked about is a potential path. Um, along with this other work towards more equitable health coverage. Um, but as I noted, solutions to discrimination may lie outside of the formula itself and be better addressed through legal remedies. Um, these tools that I've described, especially the last one for identifying undercompensated groups may be relevant in other applications, but we really need to stress and understand the context before we attempt to identify marginalized groups, especially if it may cause harm uh, by for example, collecting um, or amplifying additional stigmatizing information. In other cases, these types of tools can be used to help uh, try and mitigate harm uh, and help re remedy uh, health inequities. And so uh, a, a summation of some of the uh, fairness ideas that um, have been put forth in the literature and I've seen exemplified in my own work um, 
bias enter data and algorithms in many ways. Um, it can be anywhere in the pipeline. Having diverse teams is absolutely crucial. Lots of decisions are made by people with power um, and uh, with the power to make them. And um, any one of these decisions can uh, result in biased outcomes. Metrics, multiple metrics matter, not just multiple uh, metrics in the sense that we want to have overall fit and group fit, but we want to have multiple metrics of both in many situations. It's not as simple as add or drop an attribute that does not solve the problems we have in plan payment risk adjustment and in many other contexts. Um, algorithms may contribute to solutions. Interventions usually cannot fix the totality of the bias because it's pervasive, but it may be able to contribute to uh, getting us towards more, more equitable formulas. Again, respect the data, especially when your data involves individuals. Engage with the application or do not use it. Um, and definitely do not say, if you're using a data set as a toy problem, don't say that you solved the applied problem uh, if you haven't engaged with it. And really cite the literature, uh, make sure to cite those who work uh, who came before you. A lot of the foundational work in algorithmic fairness has been done by a lot of uh, pathbreaking Black women who are often undersighted and undercredited. So it's important that we all make sure to cite those who came uh, before. And then lastly, um, does your algorithm have a social impact statement? Uh, this is something to think about when you're building tools, whether they have a fairness uh, aspect built directly into the loss function. Um, or not, we all need to think about who's responsible to users if they're harmed. Is our tool explainable to users and how accurate is it with, again, multiple measures of accuracy? Is the algorithm itself and the data auditable by a third party? This is a big topic that we don't have time to get into, but I have lots of thoughts. And then we discussed many notions of fairness today, but definitely not comprehensive. And then lastly, um, I, I made sure to highlight Anna because she was a co-author on those three papers and a lead author on two of them. Um, but I wanted to make sure to acknowledge um, a number of other people on my team who've been working on related projects and even projects that might not seem super related, but really their ideas have contributed to just a whole vast wealth of work uh, in this broad space. And I very much appreciate them. So with that, uh, I will stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank 